karate was not developed by Okinawan peasants trying to defend themselves from the evil Japanese samurai overlords. Just look at this list of famous karate masters from Okinawa, and you will see that they all have a specific title next to their names. That's their social status in the Okinawan hierarchy. They all belong to the upper elite warrior class that's roughly six steps above a regular farmer. None of the old karate masters belong to the peasant class. The reason this myth exists is when the Japanese samurai came to Okinawa, they abolished the Ryukyu kingdom, the old caste system, and threw these aristocratic people out to live on the countryside together with the peasants. In fact, many of the weapons from Okinawa were not farming tools to begin with. They came from those upper-class aristocratic karate experts. It's funny, when I went to China to rediscover the lost roots of karate, they told me an old saying, rich people play martial arts, poor people study. It's like Gichin Funakoshi, the father of modern karate wrote, karate is the martial art of sophisticated people. That's not to say that farmers are not sophisticated, but they just didn't develop karate. That is a disturbing myth. And if you want nine more myths, then keep watching. The second myth ties back to those Okinawan weapons. Because people think karate means empty hands, so you shouldn't be using any tools, right? Wrong. Because the original name for karate was not empty hand. It was actually Chinese hand, because the Okinawan martial arts were heavily influenced from southern China. And it included both the empty hands and the weapons. And I actually rediscovered several of those in the Five Ancestors Kung Fu style when I went to China. This is why all the old Okinawan karate masters practiced with the weapons, even the ones who went to mainland Japan to modernize the art. Because like one of my Okinawan mentors, Nakamoto Masahiro Sensei, once told me, karate and kobudo is like sister and brother. They should always go together and support each other. Don't be fooled by the modern empty hand translation of karate, because originally it was much more than just your empty hands. Myth number three is that karate came from kung fu, which is sort of true, but not really. See, even though the old name for karate was Chinese hand, the birthplace of karate was a strategic island located perfectly for all kinds of trade in Southeast Asia for hundreds of years. China was just one of the countries that passed in and out of Okinawa. Many other countries brought their martial arts influence like the Siamese Kingdom, modern-day Thailand, or the Philippines that ultimately ended up creating something known as a champuru in Okinawa. Champuru is a traditional dish where you combine all kinds of stuff into like a stir fry. And that's exactly how karate formed, by mixing and combining several martial arts cultures on the island of karate. And later, when karate was modernized in mainland Japan, it had other militaristic influences like sabat, French kickboxing. Karate is much more than just a Japanese copy of Kung Fu. It's 100% its own martial art. Here's the next myth. Black belt is the ultimate achievement. First of all, the ultimate belt in the traditional old school karate styles is actually red. But most old masters don't really want to brag, so they usually wear their black belt. But furthermore, the Japanese term for when you get a black belt is shodan, which literally means first level. It's like getting your driver's license. Now you can finally start to drive your goddamn car. Yet so many people think that black is the end, because in the West we have this goal-oriented mindset. But in the East, they have this process-oriented mindset. This is why you will see tons of kids in Japan with black belts. But in the West, we think that kids should never have black belts. When in fact, it's nothing special in Japan. It's literally the first step, not the last step. Because there's a reason a black belt turns white the more you practice with it. Next myth. Karate makes you an expert at self-defense. Which maybe used to be true back in the days when the purpose of karate was self-protection. But modern karate is much more about self-perfection. We practice so we don't have to use it on the street. We practice it to improve the quality of our lives. To get in shape, get stronger, more flexible, maybe to win a medal or two. Just look at the average karate dojo and you will see that they actually spend most of their time defending against karate attacks. But what is the chance that you're actually gonna get attacked 
blocked by somebody using a perfect karate movement on the street. So if you want your karate to be useful in self-defense, you should actually defend yourself against moves that a thug would use, like grabbing you, throwing you, choking you, pushing you, these kinds of brutal, unpredictable movements, because those are the ones you will encounter in self-defense. And karate was originally designed to handle exactly those kinds of movements. Karate in its modern form is actually less than 100 years old. Here are a couple of things that are more ancient than karate. The TV, the airplane, the telephone, and the light bulb. You see, karate is what anthropologists refer to as an invented tradition. The original form of the art was very different. The word karate itself didn't even become popular until 1936, when a bunch of karate masters in mainland Japan decided to make it popular. But of course, the roots of karate stretch way further back than that. Karate doesn't work. It's just as much of a myth as karate works because there are so many different kinds of karate and it all depends on what you're trying to use them for. If you try to use sports karate in a street fight, it might work, but that's not what it was designed for. It was designed for scoring points. Similarly, if you try to use old school self-defense karate in a modern karate tournament, you're probably gonna finish last place because there's karate and there's karate. You could use either modern or traditional karate in a cage fight, for instance, in MMA, but you would always have to adapt it. And that's why we should never say that karate either works or doesn't work until we have defined exactly what type of karate we're talking about and in what way we want it to work. Karate makes you a better human being. Not really. I know tons of karate masters who are douchebags. Funakoshi Gichin said that the ultimate aim of karate is neither victory nor defeat, but to foster perfect human beings. And although we all want to strive for that ideal, the truth is that nobody's perfect. And in fact, maybe it's our imperfections that make us who we are. Maybe we should strive to embrace them and work with them rather than always being in that internal conflict. Karate can be used as a tool for self-development and perhaps it should be because maybe we don't need to use our techniques in real life. Maybe we need to use the characteristics that we develop in the dojo instead, like humility, respect, self-control, integrity, and all those attributes that make up the perfect karate practitioner. But they're not guaranteed. Karate aims to build character improve human behavior, and cultivate modesty. It does not, however, guarantee it. And that's why it's a myth that karate makes you a better human being, unless you actively strive to make that happen. It's not what you do, but how you do it. Next myth. You have to be strong and flexible to practice karate. When in fact, it's the exact opposite. I used to be chubby, weak, and stiff. And now look at me. I'm like a Greek god. I kick harder than Chuck Norris. Okay, I'm just joking. You don't have to be a superhuman to practice karate, but karate could make you a superhuman. You don't have to do any extra training. You don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to work your cardio, but you have to show up to the dojo consistently. Excellence is not an act, it's a habit, which means that the key for you, if you want to get stronger or more flexible or better at karate, is to show up to practice. That's all that really matters. Because even if you don't put in 100% effort at each and every training session, it will accumulate. And after a couple of years, you will have transformed your body, just like I did. And all I did was show up to karate over and over again. And you can too. Next myth, karate is difficult. And I get it, when you see people performing flashy or extravagant movements, it looks hard. But actually, good karate should look easy and almost effortless. The greatest karate masters on the earth make it seem like they're not really trying. And suddenly, they're right there in front of you punching your nose because they have mastered effortless action. Their economy of movement is so sophisticated. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Don't strive to make your karate look flashy and extravagant. It should look simple and easy. If you think something is difficult in karate, maybe you should take a step back and reassess the situation. The path between point A and point B is usually a straight line, not this kind of line. This is what's known as Occam's Razor. 
the easiest solution is usually the right one. And karate should be easy, because remember, it was originally designed to be used in self-defense. And if something is overly complex, you're not gonna be able to use it spontaneously. Don't be a martial artist. Be a martial artist. Don't try harder, try smarter. I want you to leave a comment and let me know what myth you find the most disturbing. And then check out some of my other videos to learn even more about the roots and origin of old school karate and how it developed to the wonderful art we all practice today. Because there is so much to learn if you just start scratching the surface. Thank you so much for watching. Train hard, good luck, and have fun.